Welcome to yet another Sunday morning in lockdown. Uh, I'm at home uh, with my wife, two of us uh, in our home, uh, and I really wish that we were gathering with God's people. Uh, dozens of us, or a few of us, or hundreds of us, or thousands of us, depending on how big your church is, wherever in the world you're meeting, celebrating the good news of Jesus together. That's a really exciting thing to be doing, isn't it? Songs of worship and praise, uh, sharing a word from God's word together, and, and just the excitement of being together. Uh, even missing the coffee together, the sort of social aspect of, uh, of church life. So I'm feeling a bit sad uh, today. Um, not sad in a, a ill or depressive sense, uh, clinically, uh, but sad about the state of the church and some of the missed opportunities I think there have been during lockdown and I worry for us about the future. And uh, the point of expressing this personal lament it is not to depress you or to discourage you, but to reflect on the reality of the situation as I see it and hopefully drive us to both prayer and action. The scripture I'm uh, looking at this morning uh, which I'm really uh, excited about because I love the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament, it is some verses in Nehemiah chapter 2. Uh, Nehemiah is the sort of butler, the cup bearer to the king, got a very uh, intimate role to make sure his food's not poisoned and that the king can eat with confidence, a pretty dangerous role uh, in the court of an ancient potentate. You might find yourself out of work very quickly and, and if if you were out of work, you'd probably be imprisoned or dead if the king's food was actually poisoned. Uh, and if it had been poisoned and you ate it first, and you hadn't missed it but eaten it, uh, you might be dead from the poison. So a pretty risky job in, in an ancient court. Nehemiah, uh, one of the Jewish exiles, finding himself a very long way from home, is desperately upset about the state of the city, the temple, the whole... Uh, religious life and the moral life and the civic life actually of the city which meant so much to him the city of Jerusalem anyway this is how the story unfolds as he tries to explain to the king uh, what the problem is he says I took the wine and gave it to the king just fulfilling his normal uh, job I had not been sad in his presence before so the king asked me why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why shouldn't my face look sad? When the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. So this is a simple, heartfelt cry from Nehemiah. All that he loves seems to have been destroyed or emptied of meaning. He's far from home and he longs for the kind of resurrection of all that means so much to him quite a long way away. And, and the king says this very powerful statement, actually. He says, you're clearly sad, but you're not ill. Uh, and so it's a heart sadness. That's quite a an amazing insight actually um, because I would say in my lament today this is how I'm feeling uh, for some of the time at least during this containment phase due to the coronavirus and the decisions our governments have made in the West to lock us all down in this confinement. I'm sad but I'm not ill uh, and I'm sad for society, and in the course of the next few days, I'll look at that again in some of these vlogs, at society as a whole. But I'm particularly sad this morning, not being physically with the church, the gathered group of God's people. I'm sad for the church, because I think we've, uh, though we've Zoomed well, and, and there have been wonderful examples of food larders and food banks working really well and caring for people and visitation and so on. I think our prophetic voice has been largely stifled. Well, I've said some of this before. I feel it acutely today and uh, want to share it with you so that you'll pray uh, and act as the Holy Spirit prompts you. I'm sad because, as you know, it's such a disappointment 
for the church to be viewed in the eyes of secular society as really not very significant at all. Less significant, uh, in fact, than almost any other shop or uh, commercial enterprise. Uh, very soon it's going to be easier to get your nails painted and your hair cut than it is to worship with God's people. What kind of priority is that for a society when we believe? that we carry the greatest good news of all, of transforming power, not just for the individual, but for communities and societies. And yes, the church occasionally speaks prophetically into situations, but around the question of lockdown and the massive level of death and pain and destruction that's going to bring to the poorest people, not just in what's sometimes called the global south or the developing world, but in our own country. Surely the church should have been speaking loudly, daily, regularly about this horror that people are going to go through a little now and far, far more in the months to come. This great sadness that descends upon me when I think of what we've done to the poorest people in our cities and towns and, of course, around the world. So the silence from some of our church leaders has been deafening. Uh, we've managed a little bit of uh, talking around uh, Dominic Cummings' uh, uh, enterprise and his, uh, his travelling north uh, for family concerns. And he's been widely mocked for driving test his eyesight and so on. And an assortment of bishops came out of the woodwork and commented on that. But the Cummings situation was a sideshow, a, a, a distraction compared with the massive issues going on around lockdown and coronavirus. And then more recently, the church has come out of the woodwork to speak about the Black Lives Matter issue and, and racism. And it's been deeply, deeply disappointing to me that the, the lack of Christian prophetic input into what the churches were saying. It was hard to distinguish what some churches were saying and church leaders from anything you could read in a hundred social media sites or on the mainstream news. White privilege, institutional racism, we better learn to listen better. Now, of course, all those things are true. They matter. But that's not the distinctive gospel church message. Surely one of the things we've got to say into the racial challenges which we face in society is distinctly about the gospel, the distinctive thing we bring as the church. That, as they used to say in the middle of the 20th century, when they were talking about the cross of Jesus and his death, they'd say the ground at the foot of the cross is level. And that meant that no colour of skin, no language group, no ethnicity, whether you were rich or poor, old or young, male or female, that really, in the presence of the death of Jesus and his resurrection, every human being, gloriously created in the image of God, every human being amazingly in need of redemption and rescue, all of us on that level needing his grace and should be in receipt of it and sharing it with others. No room for pride, no room for superiority or bigotry or prejudice against someone with a different colour skin or a different uh, racial background or ethnicity. None of that in Christian faith because of what Jesus came to do for the world and that our attitudes to someone of another nation or another colour cannot help as Christians but be transformed by what Jesus has done for us. And there shouldn't be a shred, shred of bigotry in our lives if Jesus is transforming us and changing us and our attitudes. That is a distinctive Christian thing that we bring. Of course, structures need to change for racism to be addressed. Of course, that's true. But people, you and I, need to be right with God. And the Christian message is therapeutic in its power. And so even when we've managed to speak into some of these issues, the sheer uh, mirroring of secular comment with a little uh, addendum that we might pray about it or something, has been so discouraging. When we have the glorious, wonderful, best good news in the world to share, we seem to have become supine, we seem to have become reflective, gone back into our shelves. For weeks now, one wonders whether the poor of the world have got anyone speaking for them. Where is that voice that cries with anger as 
well as with sadness about the brokenness which they're about to face. Surely that is our responsibility above anything else we should be shouting about that at this time. So like Nehemiah, well, I feel sad today. Not ill, not depressed in any clinical sense, but sad about the state of the church because I know, as you must too as you share this, that the Church of Jesus is genuinely the beautiful Bride of Christ. It's the body of Christ, the expression of his wonderful life here on earth and in many ways. And I, I accept responsibility for this as a Christian leader. In many ways we've failed to be that wonderfully loving, dynamic, community and society engaged. We're viewed by many as a complete irrelevance in this whole process a sideshow on the edge of societal norms. Dear God, rescue us and give us the passion and the courage to be all you want the church to be, as it speaks to government, as it speaks into economics and medicine and education. In fact, the whole of society, every silo of society life will be better with the breath of God upon it. So today, if you feel a bit like I do, a bit sad and fed up with the church and the way it's expressing itself, don't despair, though there's a temptation to do so. Let's take it to God in prayer. Let's work ourselves to be individual agents of this goodness. And let's share wherever we can the wonderful flourishing that comes from life in Christ. Nehemiah's story ends very well, actually. He's sad. But he gets the wonderful opportunity to go back and to make a difference in Jerusalem. The walls are rebuilt. The temples rebuilt. Society is gathered together in safety and new things emerge from the ruins of an old city. Let's pray that from the global ruins which lockdown has and is going on creating, what will emerge? is an opportunity for God's kingdom and a vibrancy in God's church that perhaps we've never seen before.